Section 7 of Chapter 18 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Raimundo. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 18. Section 7. The circumstances under which he used his veto for the first time have never yet been correctly stated. A well-meant but unskilful attempt had been made to complete a reform which the Bill of Rights had left imperfect. That great law had deprived the Crown of the power of arbitrarily removing the judges, but had not made them entirely independent. They were remunerated partly by fees and partly by salaries. Over the fees the King had no control, but the salaries he had full power to reduce or to withhold. That William had ever abused this power was not pretended, but it was undoubtedly a power which no prince ought to possess, and this was the sense of both houses. A bill was therefore brought in by which a salary of a thousand a year was strictly secured to each of the twelve judges. Thus far all was well. But unfortunately the salaries were made a charge on the hereditary revenue. No such proposition would now be entertained by the House of Commons without the royal consent previously signified by a privy councillor. But this wholesome rule had not then been established, and William could defend the proprietary rights of the crown only by putting his negative on the bill. At the time there was, as far as can now be ascertained, no outcry. Even the Jacobite libellers were almost silent. It was not till the provisions of the bill had been forgotten, and till nothing but its title was remembered, that William was accused of having been influenced by a wish to keep the judges in a state of dependence. The house broke up, and the king prepared to set out for the continent. Before his departure he made some changes in his household and in several departments of the government, changes, however, which did not indicate a very decided preference for either of the great political parties. Rochester was sworn of the council. It is probable that he had earned this mark of royal favour by taking the queen's side in the unhappy dispute between her and her sister. Pembroke took charge of the privy seal, and was succeeded at the board of admiralty by Charles Lord Conwallis, a moderate Tory. Lowther accepted a seat at the same board, and was succeeded at the treasury by Sir Edward Seymour. Many Tory country gentlemen, who had looked on Seymour as their leader in the war against placemen and Dutchmen, were moved to indignation by learning that he had become a courtier. They remembered that he had voted for a regency, that he had taken the oaths with no good grace, that he had spoken with little respect of the sovereign whom he was now ready to serve for the sake of emoluments hardly worthy of the acceptance of a man of his wealth and parliamentary interest. It was strange that the haughtiest of human beings should be the meanest, that one who settled to reverence nothing on earth but himself should abase himself for the sake of quarter day. About such reflections he troubled himself very little. He found, however, that there was one disagreeable circumstance connected with his new office. At the Board of Treasury he must sit below the Chancellor of the Exchequer. The First Lord, Godolphin, was a peer of the realm, and his right to precedence, according to the rules of the heralds, could not be questioned but everybody knew who was the first of English commoners. What was Richard Hampton that he should take the place of a Seymour, of the head of the Seymours? With much difficulty, the dispute was compromised. Many concessions were made to Sir Edward's punctilious pride. He was sworn of the council. He was appointed one of the cabinet. The king took him by the hand and presented him to the queen. I bring you, said William, a gentleman who will in my absence be a valuable friend. In this way Sir Edward was so soothed and flattered that he ceased to insist on his right to thrust himself between the First Lord and the Chancellor of the Exchequer. In the same commission of treasury in which the name of Seymour appeared, appeared also the name of a much younger politician, who had during the late session raised himself to high distinction in the House of Commons, Charles Montague. This appointment gave great satisfaction to the Whigs, in whose esteem Montague now stood higher than their veteran chiefs Sacheverell and Littleton, and was indeed second to Summers alone. Sidney delivered up the seals which he had held during more than a year, and was appointed Lord Lieutenant of Ireland. Some months elapsed before the place which he had quitted was filled up, and during this interval the whole business which had ordinarily been divided between two secretaries of state was transacted by Nottingham. While these arrangements were in progress, events had taken place in a distant part of the island which were not, till after the lapse of many months, known in the best informed circles of London, but which gradually obtained a fearful notoriety, and which, after the lapse of more than a hundred and sixty years, are never mentioned without horror. Soon after the estates of Scotland had separated in the autumn of 1690, a change was made in the administration of that kingdom. William was not satisfied with the way in which he had been represented in the Parliament House. 
he thought that the rabbled curates had been hardly treated. He had very reluctantly suffered the law which abolished patronage to be touched with his scepter. But what especially displeased him was that the acts which established a new ecclesiastical polity had not been accompanied by an act granting liberty of conscience to those who were attached to the old ecclesiastical polity. He had directed his commissioner Melville to obtain for the Episcopalians of Scotland an indulgence similar to that which dissenters enjoyed in England. But the Presbyterian preachers were loud and vehement against lenity to Amalekites. Melville, with useful talents, and perhaps with fair intentions, had neither large views nor an intrepid spirit. He shrank from uttering a word so hateful to the theological demagogues of his country as toleration, but obsequiously humouring their prejudices, he quelled the clamour which was rising at Edinburgh. But the effect of his timid caution was that a far more formidable clamour soon rose in the south of the island against the bigotry of the schismatics who domineered in the north, and against the pusillanimity of the government which had not dared to withstand that bigotry. On this subject the high churchmen and the low churchmen were of one mind, or rather the low churchman was more the angry of the two. A man like South, who had during many years been predicting that, if ever the Puritans ceased to be oppressed, they would become oppressors, was at heart not ill pleased to see his prophecy fulfilled. But in a man like Burnett, the great object of whose life had been to mitigate the animosity which the ministers of the Anglican Church felt toward the Presbyterians, the intolerant conduct of the Presbyterians could awaken no feeling but indignation, shame, and grief. There was, therefore, at the English court nobody to speak a good word for Melville. It was impossible that in such circumstances he should remain at the head of the Scottish administration. He was, however, gently let down from his high position. He continued during more than a year to be Secretary of State, but another secretary was appointed, who was to reside near the King, and to have the chief direction of affairs. The new Prime Minister of Scotland was the able, eloquent, and accomplished Sir John Darlrymple. His father, the Lord President of the Court of Session, had lately been raised to the peerage by the title of Viscount Stair, and Sir John Darlrymple was consequently, according to the ancient usage of Scotland, designated as the Master of Stair. In a few months Melville resigned his secretaryship, and accepted an office of some dignity and emolument, but of no political importance. The lowlands of Scotland were, during the year which followed the parliamentary session of 1690, as quiet as they had ever been within the memory of man, but the state of the highlands caused much anxiety to the government. The civil war in that wild region, after it had ceased to flame, had continued during some time to smoulder. At length, early in the year 1691, the rebel chiefs informed the court of St. Germain's that, pressed as they were on every side, they could hold out no longer without succor from France. James had sent them a small quantity of meal, brandy, and tobacco, and had frankly told them that he could do nothing more. Money was so scarce among them that six hundred pounds sterling would have been a most acceptable addition to their funds, but even such a sum he was unable to spare. He could scarcely, in such circumstances, expect them to defend his cause against a government which had a regular army and a large revenue. He therefore informed them that he should not take it ill of them if they made their peace with the new dynasty, provided always that they were prepared to rise in insurrection as soon as he should call them to do so. Meanwhile it had been determined at Kensington, in spite of the opposition of the Master of Stair, to try the plan which Tarbet had recommended two years before, and which, if it had been tried when he recommended it, would probably have prevented much bloodshed and confusion. It was resolved that twelve or fifteen thousand pounds should be laid out in quieting the highlands. This was a mass of treasure which to an inhabitant of Appen or Lochaber seemed almost fabulous, and which indeed bore a great proportion to the income of Keppoch or Glengarry than fifteen hundred thousand pounds bore to the income of Lord Bedford or Lord Devonshire. The sum was ample, but the king was not fortunate in the choice of an agent. John Earl of Breadalbane, the head of a younger branch of the great house of Campbell, ranked high among the petty princes of the mountains. He could bring seventeen hundred claymores into the field, and, ten years before the revolution, he had actually marched into the lowlands with this great force for the purpose of supporting the prelatical tyranny. In those days he had affected zeal for monarchy and episcopacy, but in truth he cared for no government and no religion. He seems to have united two different sets of vices, the growth of two different regions, and of two different stages in the progress of society. In his castle among the hills he had learned the barbarian pride and ferocity of a highland chief. In the council chamber at Edinburgh he had contracted the deep taint of treachery and corruption. After the revolution he had, like too many of his fellow nobles, 
joined and betrayed every party in turn, had sworn fealty to William and Mary, and had plotted against them. To trace all the turns and doublings of his course during the year of 1689 and the earlier part of 1690 would be wearisome. That course became somewhat less torturous when the Battle of the Boyne had cowed the spirit of the Jacobites. It now seemed probable that the Earl would be a loyal subject of their majesties, till some great disaster should befall them. Nobody who knew him could trust him, but few Scottish statesmen could then be trusted, and yet Scottish statesmen must be employed. His position and connections marked him out as a man who might, if he would, do much towards the work of quieting the highlands, and his interest seemed to be a guarantee for his zeal. He had, as he declared with every appearance of truth, strong personal reasons for wishing to see tranquillity restored. His domains were so situated that, while the civil war lasted, his vassals could not tend their herds or sow their orts in peace. His lands were daily ravaged, his cattle was daily driven away, one of his houses had been burned down. It was probable, therefore, that he would do his best to put an end to hostilities. He was accordingly commissioned to treat with the Jacobite chiefs, and was entrusted with the money which was to be distributed among them. He invited them to a conference at his residence in Glenarchy. They came, but the treaty went on very slowly. Every head of a tribe asked for a larger share of the English gold than was to be obtained. Breadalbane was suspected of intending to cheat both the clans and the king. The dispute between the rebels and the government was complicated with another dispute still more embarrassing. The Camerons and Macdonalds were really at war, not with William, but with MacCallum Moore, and no arrangement to which MacCallum Moore was not a party could really produce tranquillity. A grave question therefore arose, whether the money entrusted to Breadalbane should be paid directly to the discontented chiefs, or should be employed to satisfy the claims which Argyll had upon them. The shrewdness of Lochiel and the arrogant pretensions of Glengarry contributed to protract the discussions, but no Celtic potentate was so impracticable as MacDonald of Glencoe, known among the mountains by the hereditary appellation of Macian. Macian dwelt in the mouth of a ravine situated not far from the southern shore of Loch Leven, an arm of the sea which deeply indents the western coast of Scotland, and separates Argyllshire from Invernishire. Near his house were two or three small hamlets inhabited by his tribe. The whole population which he governed was not supposed to exceed two hundred souls. In the neighbourhood of the little cluster of villages was some copsewood and some pasture land, but a little further up the defile no sign of population or of fruitfulness was to be seen. In the Gaelic tongue Glencoe signifies the Glen of Weeping, and in truth that passes the most dreary and melancholy of all the Scottish passes, the very valley of the shadow of death. Mists and storms brood over it through the greater part of the finest summer, and even on those rare days when the sun is bright, and when there is no cloud in the sky, the impression made by the landscape is sad and awful. The path lies along a stream which issues from the most sullen and gloomy of mountain pools. Huge precipices of naked stone frown on both sides. Even in July the streaks of snow may often be discerned in the rifts near the summits. All down the sides of the crags heaps of ruin mark the headlong paths of the torrents. Mile after mile the traveller looks in vain for the smoke of one hut, for one human form wrapped in plaid, and listens in vain for the bark of a shepherd's dog or the bleat of a lamb. Mile after mile the only sound that indicates life is the faint cry of a bird of prey from some storm-beaten pinnacle of rock. The progress of civilization, which has turned so many wastes into fields yellow with harvests or gay with apple blossoms, has only made Glencoe more desolate. All the science and industry of a peaceful age can extract nothing valuable from that wilderness, but in an age of violence and rapine the wilderness itself was valued on account of the shelter which it afforded to the plunderer and his plunder. Nothing could be more natural than that the clan to which this rugged desert belonged should have been noted for predatory habits, for, among the highlanders generally, to rob was thought at least as honourable an employment as to cultivate the soil, and, of all the highlanders, the Macdonalds of Glencoe had the least productive soil, and the most convenient and secure den of Roberts. Successive governments had tried to punish this wild race, but no large force had ever been employed for that purpose, and a small force was easily resisted or eluded by men familiar with every recess and every outlet of the natural fortress in which they had been born and bred. The people of Glencoe would probably have been less troublesome neighbours if they had lived among their own kindred, but they were an outpost of the clan Donald, separated from every other branch of their own family, and almost surrounded by the domains of the hostile race of Darmid. 
they were impelled by hereditary enmity as well as by want to live at the expense of the tribe of campbell breadalbane's property had suffered greatly from their depredations and he was not of a temper to forgive such injuries when therefore the chief of glencoe made his appearance at the congress in glenarchy he was ungraciously received the earl who ordinarily bore himself with the solemn dignity of a castilian grandee forgot in his resentment his wonted gravity forgot his public character forgot the laws of hospitality and with angry reproaches and menaces demanded reparation for the herds which had been driven from his lands by macian's followers macian was seriously apprehensive of some personal outrage and was glad to get safe back to his own glen his pride had been wounded and the promptings of interest concurred with those of pride as the head of a people who lived by pillage he had strong reasons for wishing that the country might continue to be in a perturbed state he had little chance of receiving one guinea of the money which was to be distributed among the malcontents for his share of that money would scarcely meet breadalbane's demands for compensation and there could be little doubt that whoever might be unpaid breadalbane would take care to pay himself macian therefore did his best to dissuade his allies from accepting terms from which he could himself expect no benefit and his influence was not small his own vassals indeed were few in number but he came of the best blood of the highlands he had kept up a close connection with his more powerful kinsmen nor did they like him the less because he was a robber for he never robbed them and that robbery merely as robbery was a wicked and disgraceful act had never entered into the mind of any celtic chief macian was therefore held in high esteem by the confederates his age was venerable his aspect was majestic and he possessed in large measure those intellectual qualities which in rude societies give men an ascendancy over their fellows breadalbane found himself at every step of the negotiation thwarted by the arts of his old enemy and abhorred the name of glencoe more and more every day end of section seven recording by jen raimundo Section 8 of Chapter 18 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Raimundo. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 18, Section 8. But the government did not trust solely to Breadalbane's diplomatic skill. The authorities at Edinburgh put forth a proclamation exhorting the clans to submit to King William and Queen Mary, and offering pardon to every rebel who, on or before the 31st of December, 1691, should swear to live peaceably under the government of their majesties. It was announced that those who should hold out after that day would be treated as enemies and traitors. Warlike preparations were made, which showed that the threat was meant in earnest. The Highlanders were alarmed, and, though the pecuniary terms had not been satisfactorily settled, thought it prudent to give the pledge which was demanded of them. No chief, indeed, was willing to set the example of submission. Glengarry blustered and pretended to fortify his house. "'I will not,' said Lochiel, "'break the ice. That is a point of honour with me, but my taxmen and people may use their freedom.' His taxmen and people understood him, and repaired by hundreds to the sheriff to take the oaths. The Macdonalds of Slate's clan ronalds keppoch and even glengarry imitated the camerons and the chiefs after trying to outsay each other as long as they durst imitated their vassals the thirty first of december arrived and still the macdonalds of glencoe had not come in the punctilious pride of macian was doubtless gratified by the thought that he had continued to defy the government after the boastful glengarry the ferocious keppoch the magnanimous lochiel had yielded but he bought his gratification dear at length, on the 31st of December, he repaired to Fort William, accompanied by his principal vassals, and offered to take the oaths. To his dismay he found that there was in the fort no person competent to administer them. Colonel Hill, the governor, was not a magistrate, nor was there any magistrate nearer than Inverary. Macian, now fully sensible of the folly of which he had been guilty in postponing to the very last moment an act on which his life and his estate depended, set off for Inverary in great distress. He carried with him a letter from Hill to the sheriff of Argyleshire, Sir Colin Campbell of Ardkinglass, a respectable gentleman who, in the late reign, had suffered severely for his Whig principles. In this letter the colonel expressed a good-natured hope that, even out of season, a lost sheep, and so fine a lost sheep, would be gladly received. Macian made all the haste in his power, and did not stop even at his own house, though it lay nigh to the road. But at that time a journey through Argyleshire in the depth of winter was necessarily slow, 
the old man's progress up steep mountains and along boggy valleys was obstructed by snowstorms and it was not till the sixth of january that he presented himself before the sheriff at inverary the sheriff hesitated his power he said was limited by the terms of the proclamation and he did not see how he could swear a rebel who had not submitted within the prescribed time mckeon begged earnestly and with tears that he might be sworn his people he said would follow his example if any of them proved refractory he would himself send the recusant to prison or ship him off for islanders his entreaties and hill's letter overcame sir colin's scruples the oath was administered and a certificate was transmitted to the council at edinburgh setting forth the special circumstances which had induced the sheriff to do what he knew not to be strictly regular the news that mckeon had not submitted within the prescribed time was received with cruel joy by three powerful scotchmen who were then at the english court Bradlebane had gone up to london at christmas in order to give an account of his stewardship there he met his kinsman argyle argyle was in personal qualities one of the most insignificant of the long line of nobles who have borne that great name he was the descendant of eminent men and the parent of eminent men he was the grandson of one of the ablest of scottish politicians the son of one of the bravest and most true-hearted of scottish patriots the father of one MacCallan moore renowned as a warrior and as an orator as the model of every courtly grace and as the judicious patron of arts and letters and of another mac callan moore distinguished by talents for business and command and by skill in the exact sciences both of such an ancestry and of such a progeny argyle was unworthy he had even been guilty of the crime common enough among scottish politicians but in him singularly disgraceful of tampering with the agents of james while professing loyalty to william still argyle had the importance inseparable from high rank vast domains extensive feudal rights and almost boundless patriarchal authority to him as to his cousin breadalbane the intelligence that the tribe of glencoe was out of the protection of the law was most gratifying and the master of stair more than sympathized with them both the feeling of argyle and breadalbane is perfectly intelligible they were the heads of a great clan and they had an opportunity of destroying a neighboring clan with which they were at deadly feud Breadalbane had received peculiar provocation. His estate had been repeatedly devastated, and he had just been thwarted in a negotiation of high moment. Unhappily, there was scarcely any excess of ferocity for which a precedent could not be found in Celtic tradition. Among all warlike barbarians, revenge is esteemed the most sacred of duties and the most exquisite of pleasures, and so it had long been esteemed among the Highlanders the history of the clans abounds with frightful tales some perhaps fabulous or exaggerated some certainly true of vindictive massacres and assassinations the macdonalds of glengarry for example having been affronted by the people of culloden surrounded culloden church on a sunday shut the doors and burned the whole congregation alive while the flames were raging the hereditary musician of the murderers mocked the shrieks of the perishing crowd with the notes of his bagpipe a band of macgregors having cut off the head of an enemy laid it the mouth filled with bread and cheese on his sister's table and had the satisfaction of seeing her go mad with horror at the sight they then carried the ghastly trophy in triumph to their chief the whole clan met under the roof of an ancient church every one in turn laid his hand on the dead man's scalp and vowed to defend the slayers the inhabitants of Aig seized some macloids, bound them hand and foot and turned them adrift in a boat to be swallowed up by the waves or to perish of hunger the macloids retaliated by driving the population of egg into a cavern lighting a fire at the entrance and suffocating the whole race men women and children it is much less strange that the two great earls of the house of campbell animated by the passions of highland chieftains should have planned a highland revenge than that they should have found an accomplice and something more than an accomplice in the master of stair the master of stair was one of the first men of his time a jurist a statesman a fine scholar an eloquent orator his polished manners and lively conversation were the delight of aristocratical societies and none who met him in such societies would have thought it possible that he could bear the chief part in any atrocious crime his political principles were lax yet not more lax than those of most scotch politicians of that age cruelty had never been imputed to him those who most disliked him did him the justice to own that where his schemes of policy were not concerned he was a very good-natured man there is not the slightest reason to believe that he gained a single pound scots by the act which has covered his name with infamy he had no personal reason to wish the glencoe men ill there had been no feud between them and his family his property lay in a district where their tartan was never seen yet he hated them with a hatred as fierce and implacable as if they had laid waste to his field burnt his mansion murdered his child in the cradle 
to what cause are we to ascribe so strange an antipathy this question perplexed the master's contemporaries and any answer which may now be offered ought to be offered with diffidence the most probable conjecture is that he was actuated by an inordinate an unscrupulous a remorseless zeal for what seemed to him to be the interest of the state this explanation may startle those who have not considered how large a proportion of the blackest crimes recorded in history is to be ascribed to ill-regulated public spirit. We daily see men do for their party, for their sect, for their country, for their favorite schemes of political and social reform, what they would not do to enrich or to avenge themselves. At a temptation directly addressed to our private cupidity or to our private animosity, whatever virtue we have takes the alarm but virtue itself may contribute to the fall of him who imagines that it is in his power by violating some general rule of morality to confer an important benefit on a church on a commonwealth on mankind he silences the remonstrances of conscience and hardens his heart against the most touching spectacles of misery by repeating to himself that his intentions are pure that his objects are noble that he is doing a little evil for the sake of a great good by degrees he comes altogether to forget the turpitude of the means and the excellence of the end, and at length perpetrates without one internal twinge acts which would shock a buccaneer. There is no reason to believe that Dominic would, for the best archbishopric in Christendom, have incited ferocious marauders to plunder and slaughter a peaceful and industrious population, that ever a Digby would for a dukedom have blown a large assembly of people into the air, or that Robespierre would have murdered for hire one of the thousands whom he murdered from philanthropy. The master of Stair seems to have proposed to himself a truly great and good end, the pacification and civilization of the Highlands. He was, by the acknowledgment of those who most hated him, a man of large views. He justly thought it monstrous that a third part of Scotland should be in a state scarcely less savage than New Guinea, that letters of fire and sword should, through a third part of Scotland, be, century after century, a species of legal process, and that no attempt should be made to apply a radical remedy to such evils. The independence effected by a crowd of petty sovereigns, the contumacious resistance which they were in the habit of offering to the authority of the crown and of the court of session, their wars, their robberies, their fire-raisings, their practice of exacting blackmail from people more peaceable and more useful than themselves, naturally excited the disgust and indignation of an enlightened and politic gownsman, who was, both by the constitution of his mind and by the habits of his profession, a lover of law and order. His object was no less than a complete dissolution and reconstruction of society in the highlands, such a dissolution and reconstruction as, two generations later, followed the Battle of Culloden. In his view the clans, as they existed, were the plagues of the kingdom, and of all the clans the worst was that which inhabited Glencoe. He had, it is said, been particularly struck by a frightful instance of the lawlessness and ferocity of those marauders one of them who had been concerned in some act of violence or rapine had given information against his companions he had been bound to a tree and murdered the old chief had given the first stab and scores of dirks had then been plunged into the wretch's body by the mountaineers such an act was probably regarded as a legitimate exercise of patriarchal jurisdiction to the master of stair it seemed that people among whom such things were done and were approved ought to be treated like a pack of wolves snared by any device and slaughtered without mercy he was well read in history and doubtless knew how great rulers had in his own and other countries dealt with such banditti he doubtless knew with what energy and what severity james v had put down the moss troopers of the border how the chief of henderland had been hung over the gate of the castle in which he had prepared a banquet for the king how john armstrong and his thirty-six horsemen when they came forth to welcome their sovereign had scarcely been allowed time to say a single prayer before they were all tied up and turned off nor probably was the secretary ignorant of the means by which sixtus v had cleared the ecclesiastical state of outlaws the eulogists of that great pontiff tell us that there was one formidable gang which could not be dislodged from a stronghold among the apennines beasts of burden were therefore loaded with poisoned food and wine and sent by a road which ran close to the fastness the robbers sallied forth seized the prey feasted and died and the pious old pope exulted greatly when he heard that the corpses of thirty ruffians who had been the terror of many peaceful villages had been found lying among the mules and packages the plans of the master of stair were conceived in the spirit of james and of sixtus and the rebellion of the mountaineers furnished what seemed to be an excellent opportunity for carrying those plans into effect mere rebellion indeed he could have easily pardoned on Jacobites, as Jacobites, he never showed any inclination to bear hard. 
He hated the Highlanders, not as enemies of this or that dynasty, but as enemies of law, of industry, and of trade. In his private correspondence he applied to them the short and terrible form of words in which the implacable Roman pronounced the doom of Carthage. His project was no less than this, that the whole hill country from sea to sea and the neighboring islands should be wasted with fire and sword, that the Camerons, the Macleans, and all the branches of the race of Macdonald should be rooted out. He therefore looked with no friendly eye on schemes of reconciliation, and, while others were hoping that a little money would set everything right, hinted very intelligibly his opinion that whatever money was to be laid out on the clans would be best laid out in the form of bullets and bayonets. To the last moment he continued to flatter himself that the rebels would be obstinate, and would thus furnish him with a plea for accomplishing that great social revolution on which his heart was set. The letter is still extant in which he directed the commander of the forces in Scotland how to act if the Jacobite chiefs should come in before the end of December. There is something strangely terrible in the calmness and conciseness with which the instructions are given. Your troops will destroy entirely the country of Lochaber, Lochiel's lands, Keppocks, Glengarry's, and Glencoe's. Your power shall be large enough. I hope the soldiers will not trouble the government with prisoners. This dispatch had scarcely been sent off when news arrived in London that the rebel chiefs, after holding out long, had at last appeared before the sheriffs and taken the oaths. Lochiel, the most eminent man among them, had not only declared that he would live and die a true subject to King William, but had announced his intention of visiting England, in the hope of being permitted to kiss His Majesty's hand. In London it was announced exultingly that every clan, without exception, had submitted in time, and the announcement was generally thought most satisfactory. But the master of Stair was bitterly disappointed. The Highlanders were then to continue to be what they had been, the shame and curse of Scotland. A golden opportunity of subjecting them to the law had been suffered to escape, and might never return. If only the Macdonalds would have stood out, nay, if an example could but have been made of the two worst Macdonalds, Keppoch and Glencoe, it would have been something. But it seemed that even Keppoch and Glencoe, marauders who in any well-governed country would have been hanged thirty years before, were safe. While the master was brooding over thoughts like these, Argyle brought him some comfort. The report that Macian had taken the oath within the prescribed time was erroneous. The secretary was consoled. One clan, then, was at the mercy of the government, and that clan the most lawless of all. One great act of justice, nay, of charity, might be performed. One terrible and memorable example might be given. Yet there was a difficulty. Macian had taken the oaths. He had taken them, indeed, too late to be entitled to plead the letter of the royal promise, but the fact that he had taken them was one which evidently ought not to have been concealed from those who were to decide his fate. By a dark intrigue, of which the history is but imperfectly known, but which was, in all probability, directed by the master of Stair, the evidence of Macian's tardy submission was suppressed. The certificate which the sheriff of Argyleshire had transmitted to the council at Edinburgh was never laid before the board, but was privately submitted to some persons high in office, and particularly to Lord President Stair the father of the secretary. These persons pronounced the certificate irregular, and indeed absolutely null, and it was cancelled. End of section 8. Recording by Jen Raimundo. Section 9 of chapter 18 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jen Raimundo. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 18. Section 9. Meanwhile, the Master of Stair was forming, in concert with Breadalbane and Argyle, a plan for the destruction of the people of Glencoe. It was necessary to take the King's pleasure, not, indeed, as to the details of what was to be done, but as to the question whether Macian and his people should or should not be treated as rebels out of the pale of the ordinary law. The master of Stair found no difficulty in the royal closet. William had, in all probability, never heard the Glencoe men mentioned except as Benditti. He knew that they had not come in by the prescribed day, that they had come in after that day he did not know. If he paid any attention to the matter, he must have thought that so fair an opportunity of putting an end to the devastations and depredations from which a quiet and industrious population had suffered so much ought not to be lost. An order was laid before him for signature. He signed it, but, if Burnett may be trusted, did not read it. 
Whoever has seen anything of public business knows that princes and ministers daily sign, and indeed must sign, documents which they have not read, and of all documents a document relating to a small tribe of mountaineers, living in a wilderness not set down in any map, was least likely to interest a sovereign whose mind was full of schemes on which the fate of Europe might depend. But, even on the supposition that he read the order to which he affixed his name, there seems to be no reason for blaming him. That order, directed to the commander of the forces in Scotland, runs thus. As for Macian of Glencoe and that tribe, if they can be well distinguished from the other Highlanders, it will be proper, for the vindication of public justice, to extirpate that set of thieves. These words naturally bear a sense perfectly innocent, and would, but for the horrible event which followed, have been universally understood in that sense. It is undoubtedly one of the first duties of every government to extirpate gangs of thieves. This does not mean that every thief ought to be treacherously assassinated in his sleep, or even that every thief ought to be publicly executed after a fair trial, but that every gang, as a gang, ought to be completely broken up, and that whatever severity is indispensably necessary for that end ought to be used. If William had read and weighed the words which were submitted to him by his secretary, he would probably have understood them to mean that Glencoe was to be occupied by troops, that resistance, if resistance were attempted, was to be put down with a strong hand, that severe punishment was to be inflicted on those leading members of the clan who could be proved to have been guilty of great crimes, that some active young freebooters, who were more used to handle the broadsword than the plough, and who did not seem likely to settle down into quiet labourers, were to be sent to the army in the low countries, that others were to be transported to the American plantations, and that those Macdonalds who were suffered to remain in their native valley were to be disarmed and required to give hostages for good behaviour. A plan very near resembling this had, we know, actually been the subject of much discussion in the political circles of Edinburgh. There can be little doubt that William would have deserved well of his people if he had, in this manner, extirpated not only the tribe of Macian, but every highland tribe whose calling was to steal cattle and burn houses. The extirpation planned by the master of Stair was of a different kind. His design was to butcher the whole race of thieves, the whole damnable race. Such was the language in which his hatred vented itself. He studied the geography of the wild country which surrounded Glencoe, and made his arrangements with infernal skill. If possible, the blow must be quick, and crushing, and altogether unexpected. But if Macian should apprehend danger, and should attempt to take refuge in the territories of his neighbours, he must find every road barred. The pass of Rannoch must be secured. The laird of Weems, who was powerful in Strathte, must be told that, if he harbours the outlaws, he does so at his peril. Breadalbane promised to cut off the retreat of their fugitives on one side, MacCallum Moore on another. It was fortunate, the secretary wrote, that it was winter. This was the time to maul the wretches. The nights were so long, the mountain tops so cold and stormy, that even the hardiest men could not long bear his exposure to the open air without a roof or a spark of fire. That the women and the children could find shelter in the desert was quite impossible. While he wrote thus, no thought that he was committing a great wickedness crossed his mind. He was happy in the approbation of his own conscience. Duty, justice, nay, charity and mercy were the names under which he disguised his cruelty. Nor is it by any means improbable that the disguise imposed upon himself. Hill, who commanded the forces assembled at Fort William, was not entrusted with the execution of the design. He seems to have been a humane man. He was much distressed when he learned that the government was determined on severity, and it was probably thought that his heart might fail him in the most critical moment. He was directed to put a strong detachment under the orders of his second-in-command, Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton. To Hamilton a significant hint was conveyed that he had now an excellent opportunity of establishing his character in the estimations of those who were at the head of affairs. Of the troops entrusted to him, a large proportion were Campbell's, and belonged to a regiment lately raised by Argyle, and called by Argyle's name. It was probably thought that, on such an occasion, humanity might prove too strong for the mere habit of military obedience, and that little reliance could be placed on hearts which had not been ulcerated by a feud such as had long raged between the people of Macian and the people of MacCallum Moore. Had Hamilton marched openly against the Glencoe men and put them to the edge of the sword, the act would probably not have wanted apologists, and most certainly would not have wanted precedents. But the master of Stair had strongly recommended a different mode of proceeding, if the least alarm were given, the nest of robbers would be found empty, and to hunt them down in so wild a region would, even with all the help that Breadalbane and Argyle could give, be a long and difficult business. Better, he wrote, not meddle with them than meddle to no purpose. When the thing is resolved, let it be secret and sudden. He was obeyed, and it was determined that the Glencoe men should perish, not by military execution, 
but by the most dastardly and perfidious form of assassination. On the 1st of February, a hundred and twenty soldiers of Argyle's regiment, commanded by a captain named Campbell and a lieutenant named Lindsay, marched to Glencoe. Captain Campbell was commonly called in Scotland Glenlyon, from the pass in which his property lay. He had every qualification for the service on which he was employed, an unblushing forehead, a smooth, lying tongue, and a heart of adamant. He was also one of the few Campbells who were likely to be trusted and welcomed by the Macdonalds, for his niece was married to Alexander, the second son of Macian. The sight of the redcoats approaching caused some anxiety among the population of the valley. John, the eldest son of the chief, came, accompanied by twenty clansmen, to meet the strangers, and asked what this visit meant. Lieutenant Lindsay answered that the soldiers came as friends, and wanted nothing but quarters. They were kindly received, and were lodged under the thatched roofs of the little community. Glen Lyon and several of his men were taken into the house of a tracksman who was named, from the cluster of cabins over which he exercised authority, in Verrigan. Lindsay was accommodated nearer to the abode of the old chief. Auchentriator, one of the principal men of the clan, who governed the small hamlet of Auchnaean, found room there for a party commanded by a sergeant named Barber. Provisions were liberally supplied. There was no want of beef, which had probably fattened in distant pastures, nor was any payment demanded, for in hospitality, as in thievery, the Gaelic marauders rivalled the Bedouins. During twelve days the soldiers lived familiarly with the people of the glen. Old McGeehan, who had before felt many misgivings as to the relation in which he stood to the government, seems to have been pleased with the visit. The officers passed much of their time with him and his family. The long evenings were cheerfully spent by the peat fire with the help of some packs of cards which had found their way to that remote corner of the world, and of some French brandy which was probably part of James' farewell gift to his Highland supporters. Glen Lyon appeared to be warmly attached to his niece and her husband Alexander. Every day he came to their house to take his morning draught. Meanwhile he observed with minute attention all the avenues by which, when the signal for the slaughter should be given, the Macdonalds might attempt to escape to the hills and he reported the result of his observations to Hamilton. Hamilton fixed five o'clock in the morning of the 13th of February for the deed. He hoped that, before that time, he should reach Glencoe with four hundred men, and should have stopped all the earths in which the old fox and his two cubs, so Macian and his sons were nicknamed by the murderers, could take refuge. But at five precisely, whether Hamilton had arrived or not, Glenlyon was to fall on and to slay every Macdonald under seventy. The night was rough. Hamilton and his troops made slow progress and were long after their time. While they were contending with the wind and snow, Glen Lyon was supping and playing at cards with those whom he meant to butcher before daybreak. He and Lieutenant Lindsay had engaged themselves to dine with the old chief on the morrow. Late in the evening, a vague suspicion that some evil was intended crossed the mind of the chief's eldest son. The soldiers were evidently in a restless state, and some of them uttered strange cries. Two men, it is said, were overheard whispering. I do not like this job, one of them uttered. I should be glad to fight the Macdonalds, but to kill men in their beds. We must do as we are bid, answered another voice. If there is anything wrong, our officers must answer for it. John Macdonald was so uneasy that, soon after midnight, he went to Glenlyon's quarters. Glenlyon and his men were all up, and seemed to be getting their arms ready for action. John, much alarmed, asked what these preparations meant. Glenlyon was profuse of friendly assurances. Some of Glengarry's people have been harrying the country. We are getting ready to march against them. You are quite safe. Do you think that, if you were in any danger, I should not have given a hint to your brother Sandy and his wife? John's suspicions were quieted. He returned to his house and lay down to rest. It was five in the morning. Hamilton and his men were still some miles off, and the avenues which they were to have secured were open. But the orders which Glen Lyon had received were precise, and he began to execute them at the little village where he was himself quartered. His host in Verrigan and nine other Macdonalds were dragged out of their beds, bound hand and foot, and murdered. A boy twelve years old clung round the captain's legs, and begged hard for life. He would do anything, he would go anywhere, he would follow Glen Lyon round the world. Even Glen Lyon, it is said, showed signs of relenting, but a ruffian named Drummond shot the child dead. At Ochnian the taxman Ochentriator was up early that morning, and was sitting with eight of his family round the fire, when a volley of musketry laid him and seven of his companions dead or dying on the floor. His brother, who alone had escaped unhurt, called to Sergeant Barber, who commanded the slayers, and asked as a favor to be allowed to die in the open air. "'Well, I will do you that favor for the sake of your meat which I have eaten,' 
The mountaineer, bold, athletic, and favoured by the darkness, came forth, rushed on the soldiers who were about to level their pieces at him, flung his plaid over their faces, and was gone in a moment. Meanwhile, Lindsay had knocked at the door of the old chief, and had asked for admission in friendly language. The door was opened. McGeehan, while putting on his clothes and calling to his servants to bring some refreshment for his visitors, was shot through the head. Two of his attendants were slain with him. His wife was already up and dressed in such finery as the princesses of the rude highland glens were accustomed to wear. The assassins pulled off her clothes and trinkets. The rings were not easily taken from her fingers, but a soldier tore them away with his teeth. She died on the following day. The statesmen to whom chiefly this great crime is to be ascribed had planned it with consummate ability. But the execution was complete in nothing but in guilt and infamy. A succession of blunders saved three-fourths of the Glencoe men from the fate of their chief. All the moral qualities which fit men to bear a part in a massacre, Hamilton and Glenlyon possessed in perfection, but neither seems to have had much professional skill. Hamilton had arranged his plan without making allowance for bad weather, and this in a country and at a season when the weather was very likely to be bad. The consequence was that the Fox Earths, as he called them, were not stopped in time. Glen Lyon and his men committed the error of dispatching their hosts with firearms instead of using the cold steel. The peal and flash of gun after gun gave notice, from three different parts of the valley at once, that murder was doing. From fifty cottages the half-naked peasantry fled under cover of the night to the recesses of their pathless glen. Even the sons of McKeon, who had been especially marked out for destruction, contrived to escape. They were roused from sleep by faithful servants. John, who by the death of his father had become the patriarch of the tribe, quitted his dwelling just as twenty soldiers with fixed bayonets marched up to it. It was broad day long before Hamilton arrived. He found the work not even half performed. About thirty corpses lay wallowing in blood on the dunghills before the doors. One or two women were seen among the number, and, a yet more fearful and piteous sight, a little hand, which had been lopped in the tumult of the butchery from some infant. One aged MacDonald was found alive. He was probably too infirm to fly, and as he was above seventy was not included in the orders under which Glen Lyon had acted. Hamilton murdered the old man in cold blood. The deserted hamlets were then set on fire, and the troops departed, driving away with them many sheep and goats, nine hundred kine, and two hundred of the small shaggy ponies of the highlands. It is said, and may but too easily be believed, that the sufferings of the fugitives were terrible, how many old men, how many women with babes in their arms, sank down and slept their last sleep in the snow? How many, having crawled, spent with toil and hunger, into nooks among the precipices, died in those dark holes, and were picked to the bone by the mountain ravens, can never be known. But it is probable that those who perished by cold, weariness, and want were not less numerous than those who were slain by the assassins. When the troops had retired, the Macdonalds crept out of the caverns of Glencoe, ventured back to the spot where the huts had formerly stood, collected the scorched corpses from among the smoking ruins, and performed some rude rites of sepulture. The tradition runs that the hereditary bard of the tribe took his seat on a rock which overhung the place of slaughter, and poured forth a long lament over his murdered brethren and his desolate home. Eighty years later that sad dirge was still repeated by the population of the valley. The survivors might well apprehend that they had escaped the shot and the sword only to perish by famine. The whole domain was a waste. Houses, barns, furniture, implements of husbandry, herds, flocks, horses, were gone. Many months must elapse before the clan would be able to rise on its own ground the means of supporting even the most miserable existence. It may be thought strange that these events should not have been instantly followed by a burst of execration from every part of the civilized world. The fact, however, is that years elapsed before the public indignation was thoroughly awakened, and that months elapsed before the blackest part of the story found credit even among the enemies of the government. That the massacre should not have been mentioned in the London gazettes, in the monthly mercuries which were scarcely less courtly than the gazettes, or in pamphlets licensed by official censors, is perfectly intelligible. But that no allusion to it should be found in private journals and letters, written by persons free from all restraint, may seem extraordinary. There is not a word on the subject in Evelyn's diary. In Narcissus Luttrell's diary is a remarkable entry made five weeks after the butchery. The letters from Scotland, he says, describe that kingdom as perfectly tranquil, except that there was still some grumbling about ecclesiastical questions. The Dutch ministers regularly reported all the Scotch news to their government. They thought it worth while, about this time, to mention that a collier had been taken by a privateer near Berwick. 
that the Edinburgh mail had been robbed, that a whale, with a tongue seventeen feet long and seven feet broad, had been stranded near Aberdeen. But it is not hinted in any of their dispatches that there was any rumour of any extraordinary occurrence in the Highlands. Reports that some of the Macdonalds had been slain did indeed, in about three weeks, travel through Edinburgh up to London. But these reports were vague and contradictory, and the very worst of them was far from coming up to the horrible truth. The Whig version of the story was that the old robber Mechian had laid an ambuscade for the soldiers, that he had been caught in his own snare, and that he and some of his clan had fallen sword in hand. The Jacobite version, written at Edinburgh on the 23rd of March, appeared in the Paris Gazette of the 7th of April. Glen Lyon, it was said, had been sent with a detachment from Argyle's regiment, under cover of darkness, to surprise the inhabitants of Glencoe, and had killed thirty-six men and boys, and four women. In this there was nothing very strange or shocking. A night attack on a gang of freebooters occupying a strong natural fortress may be a perfectly legitimate military operation, and in the obscurity and confusion of such an attack the most humane man may be so unfortunate as to shoot a woman or a child. The circumstances which gave a peculiar character to the slaughter of Glencoe, the breach of faith, the breach of hospitality, the twelve days of feigned friendship and convivality, of morning calls, of social meals, of health drinking, of card playing, were not mentioned by the Edinburgh correspondent of the Paris Gazette, and we may therefore confidently infer that those circumstances were as yet unknown even to inquisitive and busy malcontents residing in the Scottish capital within a hundred miles of the spot where the deed had been done. In the south of the island the matter produced, as far as now can be judged, scarcely any sensation. To the Londoner of those days Appen was what Caffraria or Borneo is to us. He was not more moved by hearing that some highland thieves had been surprised and killed than we are by hearing that a band of Amakosa cattle-stealers has been cut off, or that a bark full of Malay pirates has been sunk. He took it for granted that nothing had been done in Glencoe beyond what was doing in many other glens. There had been a night brawl, one of a hundred night brawls, between the Macdonalds and the Campbells, and the Campbells had knocked the Macdonalds on the head. End of section 9. Recording by Jen Raimundo. Ten of Chapter Eighteen of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephanie Lee. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter Eighteen, Section Ten. By slow degrees, the whole truth came out. From a letter written at Edinburgh about two months after the crime had been committed, it appears that the horrible story was already current among the Jacobites of that city. In the summer Argyle's regiment was quartered in the south of England, and some of the men made strange confessions over their ale, about what they had been forced to do in the preceding winter. The non-jurors soon got hold of the clue, and followed it resolutely. Their secret presses went to work, and, at length, Near a year after the crime had been committed, it was published to the world. But the world was long incredulous. The habitual mendacity of the Jacobite libellers had brought on them an appropriate punishment. Now, when, for the first time, they told the truth, they were supposed to be romancing. They complained bitterly that the story, though perfectly authentic, was regarded by the public as a factious lie. So late as the year 1695, Hicks, in a tract in which he endeavoured to defend his darling tale of the Theban legion, against the unanswerable argument drawn from the silence of historians, remarked that it might well be doubted whether any historian would make mention of the massacre of Glencoe. There were in England, he said, many thousands of well-educated men who had never heard of that massacre, or who regarded it as a mere fable. Nevertheless, the punishment of some of the guilty began very early. Hill, who indeed can hardly be called guilty, was much disturbed. Brettlebane, hardened as he was, felt the stings of conscience or the dread of retribution. A few days after the Macdonalds had returned to their old dwelling-place, his steward visited the ruins of the house of Glencoe, and endeavoured to persuade the sons of the murdered chief to sign a paper declaring that they held the earl guiltless of the blood which had been shed. They were assured that, if they would do this, all his lordship's great influence should be employed to obtain for them from the crown a free pardon and a remission of all forfeitures. Glenlion did his best to assume an air of unconcern. He made his appearance in the most fashionable coffee-house at Edinburgh, 
and talked loudly and self-complacently about the important service in which he had been engaged among the mountains. Some of his soldiers, however, who observed him closely, whispered that all this bravery was put on. He was not the man that he had been before that night. The form of his countenance was changed. In all places, at all hours, whether he waked or slept, Glencoe was for ever before him. But whatever apprehensions might disturb Breadalbane, whatever spectres might haunt Glenlyon, the master of Stair had neither fear nor remorse. He was indeed mortified, but he was mortified only by the blunders of Hamilton, and by the escape of so many of the damnable breed. Do right and fear nobody, such is the language of his letters. Can there be a more sacred duty than to rid the country of thieving? The only thing that I regret is that any got away. On the 6th of March, William, entirely ignorant, in all probability, of the details of the crime which has cast a dark shade over his glory, had set out for the continent, leaving the Queen his vice-regent in England. He would perhaps have postponed his departure if he had been aware that the French government had, during some time, been making great preparations for a descent on our island. An event had taken place which had changed the policy of the court of Versailles. Louvois was no more. He had been at the head of the military administration of his country during a quarter of a century. He had borne a chief part in the direction of two wars, which had enlarged the French territory and had filled the world with the renown of the French arms, and he had lived to see the beginning of a third war which tasked his great powers to the utmost. Between him and the celebrated captains who carried his plans into execution there was little harmony. His imperious temper and his confidence in himself impelled him to interfere too much with the conduct of troops in the field, even when those troops were commanded by Conde, by Turenne, or by Luxembourg but he was the greatest adjutant-general, the greatest quartermaster-general, the greatest commissary-general that Europe had seen. He may indeed be said to have made a revolution in the art of disciplining, distributing, equipping, and provisioning armies. In spite, however, of his abilities and of his services, he had become odious to Louis and to her who governed Louis. On the last occasion on which the king and the minister transacted business together, the ill-humor on both sides broke violently forth. The servant, in his vexation, dashed his portfolio on the ground. The master, forgetting what he seldom forgot, that a king should be a gentleman, lifted his cane. Fortunately his wife was present. She, with her usual prudence, caught his arm. She then got Louvois out of the room and exhorted him to come back the next day as if nothing had happened. The next day he came, but with death in his face. The king, though full of resentment, was touched with pity and advised Louvois to go home and take care of himself. That evening the great minister died. Louvois had constantly opposed all plans for the invasion of England. His death was therefore regarded at St. Germain as a fortunate event. It was, however, necessary to look sad and to send a gentleman to Versailles with some words of condolence. The messenger found the gorgeous circle of courtiers assembled round their master on the terrace above the orangery. Sir, said Louis, in a tone so easy and cheerful that it filled all the bystanders with amazement, present my compliments and thanks to the King and Queen of England, and tell them that neither my affairs nor theirs will go on the worse by what has happened. These words were doubtless meant to intimate that the influence of Louvois had not been exerted in favor of the House of Stuart. One compliment, however, a compliment which cost France dear, Louis thought it right to pay to the memory of his ablest servant. The Marquess of Barbesseau, son of Louvois, was placed, in his twenty-fifth year, at the head of the War Department. The young man was by no means deficient in abilities, and had been, during some years, employed in business of grave importance. But his passions were strong, his judgment was not ripe, and his sudden elevation turned his head. His manners gave general disgust. Old officers complained that he kept them long in his antechamber while he was amusing himself with his spaniels and his flatterers. Those who were admitted to his presence went away disgusted by his rudeness and arrogance. As was natural at his age, he valued power chiefly as the means of procuring pleasure. Millions of crowns were expended on the luxurious villa where he loved to forget the cares of office in gay conversation, delicate cookery, and foaming champagne. He often pleaded an attack of fever as an excuse for not making his appearance at the proper hour in the royal closet, when in truth 
he had been playing truant among his boon companions and mistresses. The French king, said William, has an odd taste. He chooses an old woman for his mistress, and a young man for his minister. There can be little doubt that Louvois, by pursuing that course which had made him odious to the inmates of St. Germain, had deserved well of his country. He was not maddened by Jacobite enthusiasm. He well knew that exiles are the worst of all advisers. He had excellent information. He had excellent judgment. He calculated the chances, and he saw that a descent was likely to fail, and to fail disastrously and disgracefully. James might well be impatient to try the experiment, though the odds should be ten to one against him. He might gain, and he could not lose. His folly and obstinacy had left him nothing to risk. His food, his drink, his lodging, his clothes, he owed to charity. Nothing could be more natural than that, for the very smallest chance of recovering the three kingdoms which he had thrown away, he should be willing to stake what was not his own, the honor of the French arms, the grandeur and the safety of the French monarchy. To a French statesman, such a wager might well appear in a different light, but Louvois was gone. His master yielded to the importunity of James, and determined to send an expedition against England. The scheme was, in some respects, well concerted. It was resolved that a camp should be formed on the coast of Normandy, and that in this camp all the Irish regiments which were in the French service should be assembled under their countryman Sarsfield. With them were to be joined about ten thousand French troops. The whole army was to be commanded by Marshal Bellefonds. A noble fleet of about eighty ships of the line was to convoy this force to the shores of England. In the dockyards both of Brittany and of Provence, immense preparations were made. Four and forty men of war, some of which were among the finest that had ever been built, were assembled in the harbour of Brest under Tourville. The Count of Estray, with thirty-five more, was to sail from Toulon. Uchon was fixed by the place of rendezvous. The very day was named. In order that there might be no want either of seamen or of vessels for the intended expedition, all maritime trade, all privateering, was, for a time, interdicted by a royal mandate. Three hundred transports were collected near the spot where the troops were to embark. It was hoped that all would be ready early in the spring, before the English ships were half rigged or half manned, and before a single Dutch man of war was in the channel. James had indeed persuaded himself that, even if the English fleet should fall in with him, it would not oppose him. He imagined that he was personally a favorite with the mariners of all ranks. His emissaries had been busy among the naval officers, and had found some who remembered him with kindness, and others who were out of humor with the men now in power. All the while talk of a class of people not distinguished by taciturnity or discretion was reported to him with exaggeration, till he was deluded into a belief that he had more friends than enemies on board of the vessels which guarded our coasts. Yet he should have known that a rough sailor, who thought himself ill-used by the admiralty, might, after the third bottle, when drawn on by artful companions, express his regret for the good old times curse the new government, and curse himself for being such a fool as to fight for that government, and yet might be by no means prepared to go over to the French on the day of the battle. Of the malcontent officers who, as James believed, were impatient to desert, the great majority had probably given no pledge of their attachment to him except an idle word, hiccoughed out when they were drunk, and forgotten when they were sobered. One, those from whom he expected support, Rear Admiral Carter had indeed heard and perfectly understood what the Jacobite agents had to say, had given them fair words, and had reported the whole to the Queen and her ministers. But the chief dependence of James was on Russell. That false, arrogant, and wayward politician was to command the Channel Fleet. He had never ceased to assure the Jacobite emissaries that he was bent on effecting a restoration. Those emissaries fully reckoned, if not on his entire cooperation, yet at least on his connivance, and there could be no doubt that, with his connivance, a French fleet might easily convoy an army to our shores. James flattered himself that, as soon as he had landed, he should be master of the island, but in truth, when the voyage had ended, the difficulties of his enterprise would have been only beginning. Two years before he had received a lesson by which he should have profited. He had then deceived himself and others into the belief that the English were regretting him, were pining for him, were eager to rise in arms by tens of thousands to welcome him. William was then, as now, at a distance. Then, as now, the administration was entrusted to a woman, 
then as now there were few regular troops in england torrington had then done as much to injure the government which he served as russell could now do the french fleet had then after riding during several weeks victorious and dominant in the channel landed some troops on the southern coast the immediate effect had been that whole counties without distinction of tory or whig churchman or dissenter had risen up as one man to repel the foreigners and that the jacobite party which had a few days before seemed to be half the nation had crouched down in silent terror and had made itself so small that it had during some time been invisible what reason was there for believing that the multitude who had in sixteen ninety at the first lighting of the beacons snatched up firelocks pikes scythes to defend their native soil against the french would now welcome the french as allies and of the army by which james was now to be accompanied by the french formed the least odious part more than half of that army was to consist of irish papists and the feeling compounded of hatred and scorn with which the irish papists had long been regarded by the english protestants had by recent events been stimulated to a vehemence before unknown the hereditary slaves it was said had been for a moment free and that moment had sufficed to prove that they knew neither how to use nor how to defend their freedom during their short ascendancy they had done nothing but slay and burn and pillage and demolish and attaint and confiscate in three years they had committed such waste on their native land as thirty years of english intelligence and industry would scarcely repair they would have maintained their independence against the world if they had been as ready to fight as they were to steal but they had retreated ignominiously from the walls of londonderry they had fled like deer before the yeomanry of enniskillen the prince whom they now presumed to think that they could place by force of arms on the english throne had himself on the morning after the rout of the boyne reproached them with their cowardice and told them that he would never again trust to their soldiership on the subject englishmen were of one mind tories nonjurors even roman catholics were as loud as whigs in reviling the ill-fated race it is therefore not difficult to guess what effect would have been produced by the appearance on our soil of enemies whom on their own soil we had vanquished and trampled down james however in spite of the recent and severe teaching of experience believed whatever his correspondents in england told him and they told him that the whole nation was impatiently expecting him that both the west and the north were ready to rise that he would proceed from the place of landing to whitehall with as little opposition as when in old times he returned from a progress ferguson distinguished himself by the confidence with which he predicted a complete and bloodless victory he and his printer he was absurd enough to write would be the two first men in the realm to take horse for his majesty many other agents were busy up and down the country during the winter and the early part of the spring it does not appear that they had much success in the counties south of trent but in the north particularly in lancashire where the roman catholics were more numerous and more powerful than in any other part of the kingdom and where there seems to have been even among the protestant gentry more than the ordinary proportion of bigoted jacobites some preparations for an insurrection were made arms were privately bought officers were appointed yeomen small farmers grooms huntsmen were induced to enlist those who gave in their names were distributed into eight regiments of cavalry and dragoons and were directed to hold themselves in readiness to mount at the first signal one of the circumstances which filled james at this time with vain hopes was that his wife was pregnant and near her delivery he flattered himself that malice itself would be ashamed to repeat any longer the story of the warming pan and that multitudes whom that story had deceived would instantly return to their allegiance he took on this occasion all those precautions which four years before he had foolishly and perversely forborne to take he contrived to transmit to england letters summoning many protestant women of quality to assist at the expected birth and he promised in the name of his dear brother the most christian king that they should be free to come and go in safety had some of these witnesses been invited to st james's on the morning of the tenth of june sixteen eighty eight the house of stuart might perhaps now be reigning in our island but it is easier to keep a crown than to regain one it might be true that a calumnious fable had done much to bring about the revolution but it by no means followed that the most complete refutation of that fable would bring about a restoration not a single lady crossed the sea in obedience to james's call 
his queen was safely delivered of a daughter, but this event produced no perceptible effect on the state of public feeling in England. End of section 10「Section 11 of Chapter 18 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 18, Section 11. Meanwhile, the preparations for his expedition were going on fast. He was on the point of setting out for the place of embarkation before the English government was at all aware of the danger which was impending. It had been long known, indeed, that many thousands of Irish were assembled in Normandy, but it was supposed that they had been assembled merely that they might be mustered and drilled before they were sent to Flanders, Piedmont, and Catalonia. Now, however, intelligence arriving from many quarters left no doubt that an invasion would be almost immediately attempted vigorous preparations for defence were made. The equipping and manning of the ships was urged forward with vigour. The regular troops were drawn together between London and the sea. A great camp was formed on the down which overlooks Portsmouth. The militia all over the kingdom was called out. Two Westminster regiments and six city regiments, making up a force of thirteen thousand fighting men, were arrayed in Hyde Park and passed in review before the Queen. The train bands of Kent, Sussex, and Surrey marched down to the coast. Watchmen were posted by the beacons. Some non-jurors were imprisoned, some disarmed, some held to bail. The house of the Earl of Huntingdon, a noted Jacobite, was searched. He had time to burn his papers and to hide his arms, but his stables presented a most suspicious appearance. Horses enough to mount a whole troop of cavalry were at the mangers, and this evidence, though not legally sufficient to support a charge of treason, was thought sufficient at such a conjuncture to justify the Privy Council in sending him to the Tower. Meanwhile James had gone down to his army, which was encamped around the basin of La Hogue, on the northern coast of the peninsula known by the name of the Cotentin. Before he quitted St. Germain's, he held a chapter of the Garter for the purpose of admitting his son into the order. Two noblemen were honoured with the same distinction, Powys, who among his brother exiles was now called a duke, and Melfort, who had returned from Rome, and was again James's prime minister. Even at this moment, when it was of the greatest importance to conciliate the members of the Church of England, none but members of the Church of Rome were thought worthy of any mark of royal favour. Powys, indeed, was an eminent member of the English aristocracy, and his countrymen disliked him as little as they disliked any conspicuous papist. But Melfort was not even an Englishman. He had never held office in England, he had never sat in the English Parliament, and he had therefore no pretensions to a dignity peculiarly English. He was moreover hated by all the contending factions of all the three kingdoms. Royal letters countersigned by him had been sent both to the convention at Westminster and to the convention at Edinburgh, and both at Westminster and at Edinburgh. The sight of his odious name and handwriting had made the most zealous friends of hereditary right hang down their heads in shame. It seems strange that even James should have chosen at such a conjuncture to proclaim to the world that the men whom his people most abhorred were the men whom he most delighted to honour. Still more injurious to his interests was the declaration in which he announced his intentions to his subjects. Of all the state papers which were put forth even by him, it was the most elaborately and ostentatiously injudicious. When it had disgusted and exasperated all good Englishmen of all parties, the papists at St. Germain's pretended that it had been drawn up by a staunch Protestant, Edward Herbert, who had been Chief Justice of the Common Pleas before the Revolution, and who now bore the empty title of Chancellor. But it is certain that Herbert was never consulted about any matter of importance, and that the declaration was the work of Melfort, and Melfort alone. In truth, those qualities of head and heart which had made Melfort the favourite of his master shone forth in every sentence. 
not a word was to be found indicating that three years of banishment had made the king wiser that he had repented of a single error that he took to himself even the smallest part of the blame of that revolution which had dethroned him or that he purposed to follow a course in any respect differing from that which had already been fatal to him all the charges which had been brought against him he pronounced to be utterly unfounded wicked men had put forth calumnies weak men had believed those calumnies he alone had been faultless he held out no hope that he would consent to any restriction of that vast dispensing power to which he had formerly laid claim that he would not again in defiance of the plainest statutes fill the privy council the bench of justice the public offices the army the navy with papists that he would not re-establish the high commission that he would not appoint a new set of regulators to remodel all the constituent bodies of the kingdom he did indeed condescend to say that he would maintain the legal rights of the church of england but he had said this before and all men knew what those words meant in his mouth instead of assuring his people of his forgiveness he menaced them with a proscription more terrible than any which our island has ever seen he published a list of persons who had no mercy to expect among these were ormond carmarthen nottingham tillotson and burnett after the rolls of those who were doomed to death by name came a series of categories first stood all the crowd of rustics who had been rude to his majesty when he was stopped at sheerness in his flight these poor ignorant wretches some hundreds in number were reserved for another bloody circuit then came all persons who had in any manner borne a part in the punishment of any jacobite conspirator judges counsel witnesses grand jurymen petty jurymen sheriffs and under sheriffs constables and turnkeys in short all the ministers of justice from Holt down to Ketch. Then vengeance was denounced against all spies and all informers who had divulged to the usurpers the designs of the court of St. Germain's, all justices of the peace who should not declare for their rightful sovereign the moment that they heard of his landing, all jailers who should not instantly set political prisoners at liberty were to be left to the extreme rigor of the law no exception was made in favor of a justice or a jailer who might be within a hundred yards of one of william's regiments and a hundred miles from the nearest place where there was a single jacobite in arms it might have been expected that james after thus denouncing vengeance against large classes of his subjects would at least have offered a general amnesty to the rest but of general amnesty he said not a word he did indeed promise that any offender who was not in any of the categories of proscription, and who should by any eminent service merit indulgence, should receive a special pardon. But with this exception, all the offenders, hundreds of thousands in number, were merely informed that their fate should be decided in Parliament. The agents of James speedily dispersed his declaration over every part of the kingdom, and by doing so rendered a great service to William. The general cry was that the banished oppressor had at least given Englishmen fair warning, and that if after such a warning they welcomed him home, they would have no pretense for complaining, though every county town should be polluted by an assize resembling that which Jeffreys had held at Taunton. That some hundreds of people, the Jacobites put the number so low as five hundred, were to be hanged without mercy was certain and nobody who had concurred in the revolution, nobody who had fought for the new government by sea or land, no soldier who had borne a part in the conquest of Ireland, no Devonshire ploughman or Cornish miner who had taken arms to defend his wife and children against Tourville, could be certain that he should not be hanged. How abject, too, how spiteful, must be the nature of a man who engaged in the most momentous of all undertakings and aspiring to the noblest of all prizes could not refrain from proclaiming that he thirsted for the blood of a multitude of poor fishermen because more than three years before they had pulled him about and called him hatchet face if at the very moment when he had the strongest motives for trying to conciliate his people by the show of clemency, he could not bring himself to hold toward them any language but that of an implacable enemy, 
what was to be expected from him when he should be again their master. So savage was his nature, that in a situation in which all other tyrants have resorted to blandishments and fair promises, he could utter nothing but reproaches and threats. The only words in his declaration which had any show of graciousness were those in which he promised to send away the foreign troops as soon as his authority was re-established, and many said that those words, when examined, would be found full of sinister meaning. He held out no hope that he would send away Popish troops who were his own subjects. His intentions were manifest. The French might go, but the Irish would remain. The people of England were to be kept down by these thrice-subjugated barbarians. No doubt a rapparee who had run away at Newton Butler and the Boyne might find courage enough to guard the scaffolds on which his conquerors were to die, and to lay waste our country as he had laid waste his own. The Queen and her ministers, instead of attempting to suppress James' manifesto, very wisely reprinted it and sent it forth licensed by the Secretary of State and interspersed with remarks by a shrewd and severe commentator. It was refuted in many keen pamphlets. It was turned into doggerel rhymes, and it was left undefended even by the boldest and most acrimonious libelers among the Don jurors. Indeed, some of the non-jurors were so much alarmed by observing the effect which this manifesto produced, that they affected to treat it as spurious, and published as their master's genuine declaration a paper full of gracious professions and promises. They made him offer a free pardon to all his people with the exception of four great criminals. They made him hold out hopes of great remissions of taxation. They made him pledge his word that he would entrust the whole ecclesiastical administration to the non-juring bishops. But this forgery imposed on nobody, and was important only as showing that even the Jacobites were ashamed of the prince whom they were laboring to restore. No man read the declaration with more surprise and anger than Russell. Bad as he was, he was much under the influence of two feelings, which, though they cannot be called virtuous, have some affinity to virtue, and are respectable when compared with mere selfish cupidity. Professional spirit and party spirit were strong in him. He might be false to his country, but not to his flag. And even in becoming a Jacobite he had not ceased to be a Whig. In truth, he was a Jacobite only because he was the most intolerant and acrimonious of Whigs. He thought himself and his faction ungratefully neglected by William, and was for a time too much blinded by resentment to perceive that it would be mere madness in the old roundheads, the old exclusionists, to punish William by recalling James. The near prospect of an invasion, and the declaration in which Englishmen were plainly told what they had to expect if that invasion should be successful, produced, it would seem, a sudden and entire change in Russell's feelings, and that change he distinctly avowed. I wish, he said to Lloyd, to serve King James. The thing might be done if it were not his own fault, but he takes the wrong way with us. Let him forget all the past. Let him grant a general pardon, and then I will see what I can do for him. Lloyd hinted something about the honors and rewards designed for Russell himself, but the admiral, with a spirit worthy of a better man, cut him short. I do not wish to hear anything on that subject. My solicitude is for the public, and do not think that I will let the French triumph over us in our own sea. Understand this that if I meet them, I fight them, I, though his majesty himself should be on board. This conversation was truly reported to James, but it does not appear to have alarmed him. He was indeed possessed with a belief that Russell, even if willing, would not be able to induce the officers and sailors of the English navy to fight against their old king, who was also their old admiral. The hopes which James felt, he and his favorite Melford succeeded in imparting to Lewis and to Lewis's ministers. But for these hopes, indeed, it is probable that all thoughts of invading England in the course of that year would have been laid aside. For the extensive plan which had been formed in the winter had, in the course of the spring, been disconcerted by a succession of accidents such as are beyond the control of human wisdom.' 
the time fixed for the assembling of all the maritime forces of France at Ushant had long elapsed, and not a single sail had appeared at the place of rendezvous. The Atlantic squadron was still detained by bad weather in the port of Brest. The Mediterranean squadron, opposed by a strong west wind, was vainly struggling to pass the Pillars of Hercules. Two fine vessels had gone to pieces on the rocks of Ceuta. Meanwhile, the admiralties of the Allied powers had been active. Before the end of April, the English fleet was ready to sail. Three noble ships, just launched from our dockyards, appeared for the first time on the water. William had been hastening the maritime preparations of the United Provinces, and his exertions had been successful. On the 29th of April, a fine squadron from the Texel appeared in the Downs. Soon came the North Holland squadron, the Maze squadron the Zealand Squadron. The whole force of the Confederate powers was assembled at St. Helens in the second week of May, more than ninety sail of the line, manned by between thirty and forty thousand of the finest seamen of the two great maritime nations. Russell had the chief command. He was assisted by Sir Ralph de Laval, Sir John Ashley, Sir Cloudsley Chauvel, Rear Admiral Carter, and Rear Admiral Rook. Of the Dutch officers, Van Almond was highest in rank. No mightier armament had ever appeared in the British Channel. There was little reason for apprehending that such a force could be defeated in a fair conflict. Nevertheless, there was great uneasiness in London. It was known that there was a Jacobite party in the navy. Alarming rumors had worked their way round from France. It was said that the enemy reckoned on the cooperation of some of those officers on whose fidelity in this crisis the safety of the state might depend. Russell, as far as can now be discovered, was still unsuspected. But others, who were probably less criminal, had been more indiscreet. At all the coffee-houses, admirals and captains were mentioned by name as traitors who ought to be instantly cashiered if not shot. It was confidently affirmed that some of the guilty had been put under arrest, and others turned out of the service. The Queen and her councillors were in a great strait. It was not easy to say whether the danger of trusting the suspected persons, or the danger of removing them, were the greater. Mary, with many painful misgivings, resolved, and the event proved that she resolved wisely, to treat the evil reports as calumnious to make a solemn appeal to the honour of the accused gentlemen, and then to trust the safety of her kingdom to their national and professional spirit. On the 15th of May a great assembly of officers was convoked at St. Helens on board the Britannia, a fine three-decker from which Russell's flag was flying. The admiral told them that he had received a dispatch which he was charged to read to them. It was from Nottingham. The Queen, the secretary wrote, had been informed that stories deeply affecting the character of the navy were in circulation. It had even been affirmed that she had found herself under the necessity of dismissing many officers. But Her Majesty was determined to believe nothing against those brave servants of the state. The gentlemen who had been so foully slandered might be assured that she placed entire reliance on them letter was admirably calculated to work on those to whom it was addressed. Very few of them probably had been guilty of any worse offence than rash and angry talk over their wine. They were as yet only grumblers. If they had fancied that they were marked men, they might in self-defence have become traitors. They became enthusiastically loyal as soon as they were assured that the Queen reposed entire confidence in their loyalty. They eagerly signed an address, in which they entreated her to believe that they would, with the utmost resolution and alacrity, venture their lives in defense of her rights, of English freedom, and of the Protestant religion, against all foreign and popish invaders. God, they added, preserve your person, direct your counsels, and prosper your arms, and let all your people say Amen. The sincerity of these professions was soon brought to the test. A few hours after the meeting on board of the Britannia, the masts of Tourville's squadron were seen from the cliffs of Portland. 
One messenger galloped with the news from Weymouth to London, and roused Whitehall at three in the morning. Another took the coast road and carried the intelligence to Russell. All was ready, and on the morning of the 17th of May, the Allied fleet stood out to sea. End of section 1112 of chapter 18 of a history of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 18, section 12. Tourville had with him only his own squadron, consisting of 44 ships of the line but he had received positive orders to protect the descent on England, and not to decline a battle. Though these orders had been given before it was known at Versailles that the Dutch and English fleets had joined, he was not disposed to take on himself the responsibility of disobedience. He still remembered with bitterness the reprimand which his extreme caution had drawn upon him after the fight of Beachy Head. He would not again be told that he was a timid and unenterprising commander that he had no courage but the vulgar courage of a common sailor. He was also persuaded that the odds against him were rather apparent than real. He believed, on the authority of James and Melfort, that the English seamen, from the flag officers down to the cabin boys, were Jacobites. Those who fought would fight with half a heart, and there would probably be numerous desertions at the most critical moment. Animated by such hopes, he sailed from Brest, steered first toward the northeast, came in sight of the coast of Dorsetshire, and then struck across the channel toward La Hogue, where the army which he was to convoy to England had already begun to embark on board of the transports. He was within a few leagues of Barfleur when, before daybreak on the morning of the 19th of May, he saw the great armament of the Allies stretching along the eastern horizon. He determined to bear down on them. By eight, the two lines of battle were formed, but it was eleven before the firing began. It soon became plain that the English, from the Admiral downward, were resolved to do their duty. Russell had visited all his ships and exhorted all his crews. If your commanders play false, he said, overboard with them and with myself the first. There was no defection. There was no slackness. Carter was the first who broke the French line. He was struck by a splinter of one of his own yard arms and fell dying on the deck. He would not be carried below. He would not let go his sword. Fight the ship were his last words. Fight the ship as long as she can swim. The battle lasted until four in the afternoon. The roar of the guns was distinctly heard more than twenty miles off by the army which was encamped on the coast of Normandy. During the earlier part of the day the wind was favorable to the French. They were opposed to half of the Allied fleet, and against that half they maintained the conflict with their usual courage and with more than their usual seamanship. After a hard and doubtful fight of five hours, Tourville thought that enough had been done to maintain the honor of the white flag, and began to draw off. But by this time the wind had veered, and was with the Allies. They were now able to avail themselves of their great superiority of force. They came on fast. The retreat of the French became a flight. Tourville fought his own ship desperately. She was named, in allusion to Lewis's favorite emblem, the Royal Sun, and was widely renowned as the finest vessel in the world. It was reported among the English sailors that she was adorned with an image of the great king, and that he appeared there, as he appeared in the place of victories, with vanquished nations in chains beneath his feet. The gallant ship, surrounded by enemies, lay like a great fortress on the sea, scattering death on every side from her hundred and four portholes. She was so formidably manned that all attempts to board her failed. Long after sunset she got clear of her assailants, and with her scuppers spouting blood made for the coast of Normandy. She had suffered so much that Tourville hastily removed his flag to a ship of ninety guns which was named the Ambitious. By this time his fleet was scattered far over the sea. 
About twenty of his smallest ships made their escape by a road which was too perilous for any courage but the courage of despair. In the double darkness of night and of a thick sea fog, they ran, with all their sails spread, through the boiling waves and treacherous rocks of the race of Alderney, and by a strange good fortune arrived without a single disaster at St. Mallow's. The pursuers did not venture to follow the fugitives into that terrible strait, the place of innumerable shipwrecks. Those French vessels, which were too bulky to venture into the race of Alderney, fled to the havens of the Cotentin. The royal son and two other three-deckers reached Cherbourg in safety. The ambitious, with twelve other ships, all first-rates or second-rates, took refuge in the Bay of La Hogue, close to the headquarters of the army of James. The three ships which had fled to Cherbourg were closely chased by an English squadron under the command of Delaval. He found them hauled up into shoal water, where no large man-of-war could get at them. He therefore determined to attack them with his fire-ships and boats. The service was gallantly and successfully performed. In a short time the royal son and her two consorts were burned to ashes. Part of the crews escaped to the shore, and part fell into the hands of the English. Meanwhile, Russell, with the greater part of his victorious fleet, had blockaded the Bay of La Hogue. Here, as at Cherbourg, the French men-of-war had been drawn up into shallow water. They lay close to the camp of the army which was destined for the invasion of England. Six of them were moored under a fort named Lisset. The rest lay under the guns of another fort named St. Vast, where James had fixed his headquarters, and where the Union flag variegated by the crosses of St. George and St. Andrew, hung by the side of the white flag of France. Marshal Belfons had planted several batteries, which it was thought would deter the boldest enemy from approaching either Fort Lisset or Fort St. Vast. James, however, who knew something of English seamen, was not perfectly at ease, and proposed to send strong bodies of soldiers on board of the ships but Tourville would not consent to put such a slur on his profession. Russell, meanwhile, was preparing for an attack. On the afternoon of the 23rd of May all was ready. A flotilla consisting of sloops, of fire-ships, and of two hundred boats was entrusted to the command of Rook. The whole armament was in the highest spirits. The rowers, flushed by success and animated by the thought that they were going to fight under the eyes of the French and Irish troops who had been assembled for the purpose of subjugating England, pulled manfully and with loud huzzas toward the six huge wooden castles which lay close to Fort Lisset. The French, though an eminently brave people, have always been more liable to sudden panics than their phlegmatic neighbors, the English and Germans. On this day there was a panic both in the fleet and in the army. Tourville ordered his sailors to man their boats, and would have led them to encounter the enemy in the bay. But his example and his exhortations were vain. His boats turned round and fled in confusion. The ships were abandoned. The cannonade from Fort Lisset was so feeble and ill-directed that it did no execution. The regiments on the beach, after wasting a few musket shots, drew off. The English boarded the men of war, set them on fire, and having performed this great service without the loss of a single life, retreated at a late hour with the retreating tide. The bay was in a blaze during the night, and now and then a loud explosion announced that the flames had reached a powder room or a tier of loaded guns. At eight the next morning the tide came back strong, and with the tide came back Rook and his two hundred boats. The enemy made a faint attempt to defend the vessels which were near Fort St. Vas. During a few minutes the batteries did some execution among the crews of our skiffs, but the struggle was soon over. The French poured fast out of their ships on one side, the English poured in as fast on the other, and, with loud shouts, turned the captured guns against the shore. The batteries were speedily silenced. James and Melfort, Belfond and Tourville, looked on in helpless despondency while the second conflagration proceeded. The conquerors, leaving the ships of war in flames, made their way into an inner basin where many transports lay. Eight of these vessels were set on fire. Several were taken in tow. The rest would have been either destroyed or carried off, had not the sea again begun to ebb. It was impossible to do more, and the victorious flotilla slowly retired, insulting the hostile camp with a thundering chant of God save the King. 
Thus ended, at noon on the 24th of May, the great conflict which had raged during five days over a wide extent of sea and shore. One English fireship had perished in its calling. Sixteen French men of war, all noble vessels, and eight of them three-deckers, had been sunk or burned down to the keel. The battle is called, from the place where it terminated, the Battle of La Hogue. The news was received in London with boundless exultation. In the fight on the open sea, indeed, the numerical superiority of the Allies had been so great that they had little reason to boast of their success. But the courage and skill with which the crews of the English boats had in a French harbor, in sight of a French army, and under the fire of French batteries, destroyed a fine French fleet, amply justified the pride with which our fathers pronounced the name of La Hogue. That we may fully enter into their feelings, we must remember that this was the first great check that had ever been given to the arms of Louis the Fourteenth, and the first great victory that the English had gained over the French since the days of Agincourt. The stain left on our fame by the shameful defeat of Beachy Head was effaced. This time the glory was all our own. The Dutch had indeed done their duty, as they have always done it in maritime war, whether fighting on our side or against us, whether victorious or vanquished. But the English had borne the brunt of the fight. Russell, who commanded in chief, was an Englishman. Delaval, who directed the attack on Cherbourg, was an Englishman. Rook, who led the flotilla into the Bay of La Hogue, was an Englishman. The only two officers of note who had fallen, Admiral Carter and Captain Hastings of the Sandwich, were Englishmen. Yet the pleasure with which the good news was received here must not be ascribed solely or chiefly to national pride. The island was safe. The pleasant pastures, cornfields, and commons of Hampshire and Surrey would not be the seat of war. The houses and gardens, the kitchens and dairies, the cellars and plate chests, the wives and daughters of our gentry and clergy would not be at the mercy of Irish rapparees, who had sacked the dwellings and skinned the cattle of the Englishry of Leinster, or of French dragoons accustomed to live at free quarters on the Protestants of Auvergne. Whigs and Tories joined in thanking God for this great deliverance, and the most respectable non-jurors could not but be glad at heart that the rightful king was not to be brought back by an army of foreigners. The public joy was therefore all but universal. During several days the bells of London pealed without ceasing. Flags were flying on all the steeples. Rows of candles were in all the windows. Bonfires were at all the corners of the streets. The sense which the government entertained of the services of the navy was promptly, judiciously, and gracefully manifested. Sydney and Portland were sent to meet the fleet at Portsmouth, and were accompanied by Rochester as the representative of the Tories. The three lords took down with them thirty-seven thousand pounds in coin, which they were to distribute as a donative among the sailors. Gold medals were given to the officers. The remains of Hastings and Carter were brought on shore with every mark of honor. Carter was buried at Portsmouth, with a great display of military pomp. The corpse of Hastings was brought up to London, and laid with unusual solemnity under the pavement of St. James Church. The foot guards with reversed arms escorted the hearse. Four royal state carriages, each drawn by six horses, were in the procession. A crowd of men of quality in mourning cloaks filled the pews, and the Bishop of London preached the funeral sermon. While such marks of respect were paid to the slain, the wounded were not neglected. Fifty surgeons, plentifully supplied with instruments, bandages, and drugs, were sent down in all haste from London to Portsmouth. It is not easy for us to form a notion of the difficulty which there then was in providing at short notice commodious shelter and skilful attendance for hundreds of maimed and lacerated men. At present every county, every large town, can boast of some spacious palace in which the poorest laborer who has fractured a limb may find an excellent bed, an able medical attendant, a careful nurse, medicines of the best quality, and nourishment such as an invalid requires. 
But there was not then, in the whole realm, a single infirmary supported by voluntary contribution. Even in the capital, the only edifices open to the wounded were the two ancient hospitals of St. Thomas and St. Bartholomew. The Queen gave orders that in both these hospitals arrangements should be made at the public charge for the reception of patients from the fleet. At the same time, it was announced that a noble and lasting memorial of the gratitude which England felt for the courage and patriotism of her sailors would soon rise on a site eminently appropriate. Among the suburban residences of our kings, that which stood at Greenwich had long held a distinguished place. Charles the Second liked the situation, and determined to rebuild the house and to improve the gardens. Soon after his restoration, he began to erect, on a spot almost washed by the Thames at high tide, a mansion of vast extent and cost. Behind the palace were planted long avenues of trees, which, when William reigned, were scarcely more than saplings, but which have now covered with their massy shade the summer rambles of several generations. On the slope, which has long been the scene of the holiday sports of the Londoners, were constructed flights of terraces, of which the vestiges may still be discerned. The Queen now publicly declared in her husband's name that the building commenced by Charles should be completed, and should be a retreat for seamen disabled in the service of their country. One of the happiest effects produced by the good news was the calming of the public mind. During about a month the nation had been hourly expecting an invasion and a rising, and had consequently been in an irritable and suspicious mood. In many parts of England a non-juror could not show himself without great risk of being insulted. A report that arms were hidden in a house sufficed to bring a furious mob to the door. The mansion of one Jacobite gentleman in Kent had been attacked, and after a fight in which several shots were fired, had been stormed and pulled down. Yet such riots were by no means the worst symptoms of the fever which had inflamed the whole society. The exposure of Fuller, in February, had, as it seemed, put an end to the practices of that vile tribe of which Oates was the patriarch. During some weeks, indeed, the world was disposed to be unreasonably incredulous about plots. But in April there was a reaction. The French and Irish were coming. There was but too much reason to believe that there were traitors in the island. Whoever pretended that he could point out those traitors was sure to be heard with attention, and there was not wanting a false witness to avail himself of the golden opportunity. End of section 12thirteen of chapter eighteen of a history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org history of england by thomas babington macaulay chapter eighteen section thirteen the false witness was named robert young his history was in his own lifetime so fully investigated, and so much of his correspondence has been preserved, that the whole man is before us. His character is indeed a curious study. His birthplace was a subject of dispute among three nations. The English pronounced him Irish. The Irish, not being ambitious of the honour of having him for a countryman, affirmed that he was born in Scotland. Wherever he may have been born, it is impossible to doubt where he was bred, for his phraseology is precisely that of the Teagues, who were, in his time, favorite characters on our stage. He called himself a priest of the established church, but he was in truth only a deacon, and his deacon's orders he had obtained by producing forged certificates of his learning and moral character. Long before the Revolution he held curacies in various parts of Ireland, but he did not remain many days in any spot. He was driven from one place by the scandal, which was the effect of his lawless amours. He rode away from another place on a borrowed horse, which he never returned. He settled in a third parish, and was taken up for bigamy. Some letters which he wrote on this occasion from the jail of Cavan have been preserved. 
he assured each of his wives, with the most frightful imprecations, that she alone was the object of his love, and he thus succeeded in inducing one of them to support him in prison, and the other to save his life by forswearing herself at the assizes. The only specimens which remain to us of his method of imparting religious instruction are to be found in these epistles. He compares himself to David, the man after God's own heart, who had been guilty both of adultery and murder. He declares that he repents. He prays for the forgiveness of the Almighty, and then entreats his dear honey, for Christ's sake, to perjure herself. Having narrowly escaped the gallows, he wandered during several years about Ireland and England, begging, stealing, cheating, personating, forging, and lay in many prisons under many names. In 1684 he was convicted at Bury of having fraudulently counterfeited Sancroft's signature, and was sentenced to the pillory and to imprisonment. From his dungeon he wrote to employ the primate's mercy. The letter may still be read with all the original bad grammar and bad spelling. The writer acknowledged his guilt, wished that his eyes were a fountain of water, declared that he should never know peace till he had received episcopal absolution, and professed a mortal hatred of dissenters. As all this contrition and all this orthodoxy produced no effect, the penitent, after swearing bitterly to be revenged on Sancroft, betook himself to another device. The western insurrection had just broken out. The magistrates all over the country were but too ready to listen to any accusation that might be brought against Whigs and nonconformists. Young declared on oath that, to his knowledge, a design had been formed in Suffolk against the life of King James, and named a peer, several gentlemen, and ten Presbyterian ministers as parties to the plot. Some of the accused were brought to trial and Young appeared in the witness-box, but the story which he told was proved by overwhelming evidence to be false. Soon after the revolution, he was again convicted of forgery, pilloried for the fourth or fifth time, and sent to Newgate. While he lay there, he determined to try whether he should be more fortunate as an accuser of Jacobites than he had been as an accuser of Puritans. He first addressed himself to Tillotson, there was a horrible plot against their majesties, a plot as deep as hell, and some of the first men in England were concerned in it. Tillotson, though he placed little confidence in information coming from such a source, thought that the oath which he had taken as privy councillor made it his duty to mention the subject to William. William, after his fashion, treated the matter very lightly. I am confident, he said, that this is a villainy, and I will have nobody disturbed on such grounds. After this rebuff, Young remained some time quiet. But when William was on the continent, and when the nation was agitated by the apprehension of a French invasion and of a Jacobite insurrection, a false accuser might hope to obtain a favorable audience. The mere oath of a man who was well known to the turnkeys of twenty jails was not likely to injure anybody, but Young was a master of a weapon which is of all weapons the most formidable to innocence. He had lived during some years by counterfeiting hands, and had at length attained such consummate skill in that bad art that even experienced clerks who were conversant with manuscript could scarcely, after the most minute comparison, discover any difference between his imitations and the originals. He had succeeded in making a collection of papers written by men of note who were suspected of disaffection. Some autographs he had stolen, and some he had obtained by writing in feigned names to ask after the characters of servants or curates. He now drew up a paper purporting to be an association for the restoration of the banished king. This document set forth that the subscribers bound themselves in the presence of God to take arms for His Majesty, and to seize on the Prince of Orange, dead or alive. To the association Young appended the names of Marlborough, of Cornbury, of Salisbury, of Sancroft, and of Spratt, Bishop of Rochester and Dean of Westminster. The next thing to be done was to put the paper into some hiding place in the house of one of the persons whose signatures had been counterfeited.
As Young could not quit Newgate, he was forced to employ a subordinate agent for this purpose. He selected a wretch named Blackhead, who had formerly been convicted of perjury and sentenced to have his ears clipped. The selection was not happy, for Blackhead had none of the qualities which the trade of a false witness requires except wickedness. There was nothing plausible about him. His voice was harsh. Treachery was written in all the lines of his yellow face. He had no invention, no presence of mind, and could do little more than repeat by rote the lies taught him by others. This man, instructed by his accomplice, repaired to Spratt's palace at Bromley, introducing himself there as the confidential servant of an imaginary doctor of divinity, delivered to the bishop on bended knee, a letter ingeniously manufactured by Young, and received with the semblance of profound reverence the Episcopal benediction. The servants made the stranger welcome. He was taken to the cellar, drank their master's health, and entreated them to let him see the house. They could not venture to show any of the private apartments. Blackhead, therefore, after begging importunately, but in vain, to be suffered to have one look at the study, was forced to content himself with dropping the association into a flower-pot which stood in a parlour near the kitchen. Everything having been thus prepared, Young informed the ministers that he could tell them something of the highest importance to the welfare of the state, and earnestly begged to be heard. His request reached them on perhaps the most anxious day of an anxious month. Tourville had just stood out to sea. The army of James was embarking. London was agitated by reports about the disaffection of the naval officers. The Queen was deliberating whether she should cashier those who were suspected, or try the effect of an appeal to their honour and patriotism. At such a moment the ministers could not refuse to listen to any person who professed himself able to give them valuable information. Young and his accomplice were brought before the Privy Council. They there accused Marlborough, Cornbury, Salisbury, Sancroft, and Spratt of high treason. These great men, Young said, had invited James to invade England, and had promised to join him. The eloquent and ingenious Bishop of Rochester had undertaken to draw up a declaration which would inflame the nation against the government of King William. The conspirators were bound together by a written instrument. That instrument, signed by their own hands, would be found at Bromley if careful search was made. Young particularly requested that the messengers might be ordered to examine the bishop's flower-pots. The ministers were seriously alarmed. The story was circumstantial, and part of it was probable. Marlborough's dealings with St. Germain's were well known to Carmarthen, to Nottingham, and to Sydney. Cornbury was a tool of Marlborough, and was a son of a non-juror, and of a notorious plotter. Salisbury was a papist. Sancroft had, not many months before, been, with too much show of reason, suspected of inviting the French to invade England. Of all the accused persons, Spratt was the most unlikely to be concerned in any hazardous design. He had neither enthusiasm nor constancy. Both his ambition and his party spirit had always been effectually kept in order by his love of ease and his anxiety for his own safety. He had been guilty of some criminal compliances in the hope of gaining the favour of James, had sat in the High Commission, had concurred in several iniquitous decrees pronounced by that court, and had, with trembling hands and faltering voice, read the Declaration of Indulgence in the choir of the Abbey. But there he had stopped. As soon as it began to be whispered that the civil and religious constitution of England would speedily be vindicated by extraordinary means, he had resigned his powers, which he had during two years exercised in defiance of law, and had hastened to make his peace with his clerical brethren. He had in the convention voted for a regency, but he had taken the oaths without hesitation. He had borne a conspicuous part in the coronation of the new sovereigns, and by his skilful hand had been added to the form of prayer used on the 5th of November those sentences in which the Church expresses her gratitude for the second great deliverance wrought on that day. Such a man, possessed of a plentiful income, 
of a seat in the House of Lords, of one agreeable house among the elms of Bromley, and of another in the cloisters of Westminster, was very unlikely to run the risk of martyrdom. He was not, indeed, on perfectly good terms with the government, for the feeling which, next to solicitude for his own comfort and repose, seems to have had the greatest influence on his public conduct, was his dislike of the Puritans, a dislike which sprang not from bigotry, but from Epicureanism. Their austerity was a reproach to his slothful and luxurious life. Their phraseology shocked his fastidious taste, and where they were concerned his ordinary good nature forsook him. Loathing the nonconformists as he did, he was not likely to be very zealous for a prince whom the nonconformists regarded as their protector. But Spratt's faults afforded ample security that he would never, from spleen against William, engage in any plot to bring back James. Why Young should have assigned the most perilous part in an enterprise full of peril to a man singularly pliant, cautious, and self-indulgent, it is difficult to say. The first step which the ministers took was to send Marlborough to the tower. He was by far the most formidable of all the accused persons, and that he had held a traitorous correspondence with St. Germain's was a fact which, whether Young were perjured or not, the Queen and her chief advisers knew to be true. One of the clerks of the council and several messengers were sent down to Bromley with a warrant from Nottingham. Spratt was taken into custody. All the apartments in which it could reasonably be supposed that he would have hidden an important document were searched, the library, the dining-room, the drawing-room, the bedchamber, and the adjacent closets. His papers were strictly examined. Much food prose was found, and probably some bad verse, but no treason. The messengers pried into every flower-pot that they could find, but to no purpose. It never occurred to them to look into the room in which Blackhead had hidden the association, for that room was near the offices occupied by the servants, and was little used by the bishop and his family. The officers returned to London with their prisoner, but without the document which, if it had been found, might have been fatal to him. Late at night he was brought to Westminster, and was suffered to sleep at his deanery. All his bookcases and drawers were examined and sentinels were posted at the door of his bedchamber, but with strict orders to behave civilly and not to disturb the family. On the following day he was brought before the council. The examination was conducted by Nottingham, with great humanity and courtesy. The bishop, conscious of entire innocence, behaved with temper and firmness. He made no complaints. I submit, he said, to the necessities of state in such a time of jealousy and danger as this. He was asked whether he had drawn up a declaration for King James, whether he had held any correspondence with France, whether he had signed any treasonable association, and whether he knew of any such association. To all these questions he, with perfect truth, answered in the negative, on the word of a Christian and a bishop. He was taken back to his deanery. He remained there in easy confinement during ten days, and then, as nothing tending to criminate him had been discovered, was suffered to return to Bromley. Meanwhile the false accusers had been devising a new scheme. Blackhead paid another visit to Bromley, and contrived to take the forged association out of the place in which he had hid it, and bring it back to Young. One of Young's two wives then carried it to the secretary's office, and told a lie invented by her husband to explain how a paper of such importance had come into her hands. But it was not now so easy to frighten the ministers as it had been a few days before. The Battle of La Hogue had put an end to all of apprehensions of invasion. Nottingham, therefore, instead of sending down a warrant to Bromley, merely wrote to beg that Spratt would call on him at Whitehall. The summons was promptly obeyed, and the accused prelate was brought face to face with Blackhead before the council. Then the truth came out fast. The bishop remembered the villainous look and voice of the man who had knelt to ask the episcopal blessing. The bishop's secretary confirmed his master's assertions. The false witness soon lost his presence of mind. His cheeks, always sallow, grew frightfully livid, 
His voice, generally loud and coarse, sank into a whisper. The privy councillors saw his confusion, and cross-examined him sharply. For a time he answered their questions by repeatedly stammering out his original lie in the original words. At last he found that he had no way of extricating himself but by owning his guilt. He acknowledged that he had given an untrue account of his visit to Bromley, and after much prevarication he related how he had hidden the association, and how he had removed it from its hiding place, and confessed that he had been set on by Young. The two accomplices were then confronted. Young, with unabashed forehead, denied everything. He knew nothing about the flower-pots. If so, cried Nottingham and Sidney together, why did you give such particular directions that the flower-pots at Bromley should be searched? I never gave any directions about the flower-pots, said Young. Then the whole board broke forth. How dare you say so? We all remember it. Still the knave stood up erect and exclaimed with an impudence which Oates might have envied, "'This hiding is all a trick got up between the bishop and Blackhead. The bishop has taken Blackhead off, and they are both trying to stifle the plot.' This was too much. There was a smile and a lifting up of hands all round the board. "'Man!' cried Carmarthen. Wouldst thou have us believe that the bishop contrived to have this paper put where it was ten to one that our messengers had found it, and where, if they had found it, it might have hanged him? The false accusers were removed in custody. The bishop, after warmly thanking the ministers for their fair and honorable conduct, took his leave of them. In the antechamber he found a crowd of people staring at Young while Young sat enduring the stare with the serene fortitude of a man who had looked down on far greater multitudes from half the pillories in England. Young, said Spratt, your conscience must tell you that you have cruelly wronged me. For your sake I am sorry that you persist in denying what your associate has confessed. Confessed? cried Young. No, all is not confessed yet, and that you shall find to your sorrow. There is such a thing as impeachment, my lord. When Parliament sits, you shall hear more of me. God give you repentance, answered the bishop, for depend on it, you are in much more danger of being damned than I of being impeached. Forty-eight hours after the detection of this execrable fraud, Marlborough was admitted to bail. Young and Blackhead had done him an inestimable service that he was concerned in a plot quite as criminal as that which they had falsely imputed to him, and that the government was in possession of moral proofs of his guilt, is now certain. But his contemporaries had not, as we have, the evidence of his perfidy before them. They knew that he had been accused of an offence of which he was innocent, that perjury and forgery had been employed to ruin him, and that in consequence of these machinations he had passed some weeks in the tower. There was in the public mind a very natural confusion between his disgrace and his imprisonment. He had been imprisoned without sufficient cause. Might it not, in the absence of all information, be reasonably presumed that he had been disgraced without sufficient cause? It was certain that a vile calumny, destitute of all foundation, had caused him to be treated as a criminal in May. Was it not probable, then, that calumny might have deprived him of his master's favor in January. Young's resources were not yet exhausted. As soon as he had been carried back from Whitehall to Newgate, he set himself to construct a new plot and to find a new accomplice. He addressed himself to a man named Holland, who was in the lowest state of poverty. Never, said Young, was there such a golden opportunity. A bold, shrewd fellow might easily earn five hundred pounds. To Holland, five hundred pounds seemed fabulous wealth. What, he asked, was he to do for it? Nothing, he was told, but to speak the truth. That was to say, substantial truth, a little disguised and colored. There really was a plot, and this would have been proved if Blackhead had not been bought off. His desertion had made it necessary to call in the help of fiction. You must swear that you and I were in the back room upstairs at the Lobster in Southwark. Some men came to meet us there. They gave a password before they were admitted. 
They were all in white camlet cloaks. They signed the association in our presence. Then they paid each his shilling and went away. And you must be ready to identify my Lord Marlborough and the Bishop of Rochester as two of these men. How can I identify them? said Holland. I never saw them. You must contrive to see them, answered the tempter, as soon as you can. The bishop will be at the abbey. Anybody about the court will point out my lord Marlborough. Holland immediately went to Whitehall, and repeated this conversation to Nottingham. The unlucky imitator of Oates was prosecuted, by order of the government, for perjury, subornation of perjury, and forgery. He was convicted and imprisoned, was again set in the pillory, and underwent, in addition to the exposure, about which he cared little, such a pelting as had seldom been known. After his punishment he was, during some years, lost in the crowd of pilferers, ring-droppers, and sharpers who infested the capital. At length, in the year 1700, he emerged from his obscurity and excited a momentary interest. The newspapers announced that Robert Young, Clark, once so famous, had been taken up for coining, then that he had been found guilty, then that the dead warrant had come down, and finally that the reverend gentleman had been hanged at Tyburn, and had greatly edified a large assembly of spectators by his penitence. End of section 13 End of chapter 18 of the History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay